Okay, March 23rd, 2021 meeting of the advisory committee to order. Um, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternative means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Ham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. As we have with all our meetings this year, the advisory committee is having this meeting recorded and it will be available on Harbor Media YouTube station. Is there any member of the public or person attending who is independently recording this? If so, please identify themselves by name and address. I am not seeing anyone raising their hand virtually or otherwise identify themselves. So we come to our second item on the agenda, which is questions from the public on items not on the agenda. Is there any member of the public that has a question about something that is not on the agenda? Uh, if so, please identify yourself by name and address and direct your questions to me. I'm not seeing any virtual or actual hands raised. So that will bring us to um, item three on our agenda, which is the community planning budget. I'm sure you're all happy to return to your budget books. Uh, seems like budget season was ages ago. And Victor, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob. Um, so if everyone could turn to page 13 of their budget books, that's the community planning um, page. So the community planning department um, provides staff for the planning board and oversees planning activities in town, South Hingham, downtown, master plan, harbor, anything of that sort. Um, planning board itself has a wide range of responsibilities, uh, not just special permits and subdivisions, uh, but also shade trees and other things of that sort. So the stormwater, uh, so the planning department provides support for those activities as well. Uh, the budget and the reason we've been delayed on this one was thrown into disarray when the director and the administrative assistant, so the the two staff people um, resigned. The, the administrative assistant moved over to the uh, school department for a secretarial job there. Um, so currently uh, there's no permanent staff in the department. There is an interim director who's part-time. Tom Mayo uh, has um, proposed which we heard a couple of weeks ago and we'll consider, I'm sure, further on Thursday, um, revamping the department. Uh, in the absence of that, um, we're looking at the existing budget uh, that was prepared back in November before the resignations. Uh, that shows salaries at $166,861 dollars that's up only $2,400 from the prior year, 1.5%. Uh, there's also an additional request for another staff, which I'll mention, come back to. Um, on the expense side, expenses are at $24,205, up 11.5%, uh, not large dollars though. Uh, the increases are in a couple of line items to reflect actual fiscal 20 costs uh, office supplies and um, I guess uh, I think it was advertising as well. Um, so it seemed more realistic to have those use those figures in the uh, upcoming uh, but the fiscal 22 budget request. Major expense category is consulting fees, though you'll note that's 11,000 of the uh, 
of the expense figure. Coming back to the additional request, the November um, proposal, which is in your in the budget book, uh, was sixty-five thousand nine hundred twenty-one dollars for an assistant town planner to help the director with all of the activities that the uh, the staff, uh, the department rather, uh, does. Um, with the resignations, Tom has revisited the idea of how to set up the department, and he's now proposing to still have an additional request for a new staff person, but that would be a senior planner. So that's a higher level position than a um, assistant planner. Uh, for comparison, um, Emily Wentworth in land use and uh, Lonnie Fournier in um, conservation are senior planners, they're department heads. Um, so in any event, that, that additional request though you may recall when it was presented to us a couple of weeks ago is actually a bit lower than the 65,000. It's $63,403. The way that works out is the responsibilities of the department head would be revamped and um, so that the grade of that position would be lowered. So that salary would come down allowing the senior planner to have a higher salary than the assistant planner, but on net, it would actually be less than the original additional request. The senior planner in the current thinking would be um, devoted to full-time staff for the planning board and all planning board activities, whereas the um, director, whatever the title might turn out to be, would be doing larger scale conceptual, Tom used the phrase, big think um, activities, doing planning for all the items that I mentioned before, South Hingham, uh, downtown, Harbor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also that position would take um, charge of coordinating in internal, meaning all of the departments, reviews of major land use applications. So that would be the, um, the, the contemplated um, division of responsibilities. And that person also would be the head of the department. Um, so, but that is dependent on our uh, approval of the additional request, which of course uh, we're not going, I'm not going to make a recommendation on at this point. Um, so I, I guess I'll pause and ask if there are questions. I'll simply observe that uh, uh, Tom's slides when he made his uh, uh, presentation of uh, town administrator's budget recommendations include all the information about uh, uh, the, the new setup of community planning. Dave, go ahead. Victor, I was just curious, maybe I missed it, but if the if kind of the salary of the department head, as I understood it, in the new structure is contingent to a certain degree on the uh, on the decision on the additional request hire, how do we kind of reconcile that? You know, in other words, if we were to approve a budget, or if you were to recommend a budget tonight that excludes that, is that a different budget than the one that would be? Do you follow me? Sorry, I'm not being. Yeah, no, I, I do. So you're just saying, I think I, I do. So you're suggesting that. Why couldn't the planning director's salary be at the lower grade and not have the additional staff person? Is that what you're getting at? Well, what I'm getting at, yes, because by extension, if, if for some reason the additional request wasn't funded this year, but the, obviously the community planning budget was approved, would Tom continue to seek that person perhaps next year, in which case we would still want to be positioned to take on that, that new role? I would expect that he would want to come back next year and um, you know, seek that position. I mean, his goal pre-COVID for what is called the second floor was that this was the year that he was going to sort of do major changes there um, you yeah. know, and didn't happen, of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question though, Dave. I, I guess I would recommend, and I will be recommending the full department head amount as shown in the budget book. But if 
the additional request didn't get approved, whether Tom would seek to fill that at that level, I don't know. Thanks. Uh, George? Uh, yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, Victor, I wonder if you had have some insight on uh, printing supplies, uh, printing services, and consulting. Uh, looking at the 20 actuals compared to the 22 budgets. Yeah, I uh, think both that, of them are up substantially. Yeah, so let me just get the line items. So I think that that is likely related to COVID situations, that there was a decrease in activity uh, at, uh, for a part of the year. Okay, um, okay. So. All right. So the 22 request is more in line with uh, what, what would be the history of it. Yeah, and you know, this budget is, you, you may remember the discussions when we had on conservation and land use, that it's only been a couple of years that each of these departments has had its own separate budget. Uh, there was one large group, which was called community planning, that had all of the subsidiary budgets. So there's not a lot of track record for what each of these individual groups actually needs. That's right. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Julie. Victor, can you speak at all to who is filling the role right now as director and for any open positions? Does it, is it uh, expected that those open positions would be filled by the beginning of the next fiscal year? Or do you think there would be savings because some things are going to be left open? Uh, so C Christine Stickney, I, I believe her last name is, is the interim um, planning director. I think she puts in 20 hours a week. She's also an interim or part-time. I don't know if she's interim, part-time at Hanover. Uh, she's very experienced, had been at Braintree, I think on two occasions and for a number of years as uh, in their planning department. Um, in terms of, is there, and, and I don't know. I don't know whether Tom is planning to hire this year, um, this fiscal year. I'm assuming that he wants to see what gets approved and if he can go ahead with his you know, longer range plan. Um, but I, I have not asked him that question. In terms of other staff support for the planning board, Susan Murphy has been, um, which of course comes out of legal uh, costs, has been uh, providing a lot of assistance, a lot more than typical and more, um, maybe not day to day, but more, more in the weeds um, help for the planning board than um, she might otherwise be doing. So that, that they've been, the board has been handling things by a combination of Christine and Susan. Are there any questions from comments from other members of advisory? Um, questions or comments from other town board members? Questions or comments from members of the public? I, I think, Victor, if you want to go ahead and make a recommendation, I understand it's a little unusual under the circumstances. <laughs> um, I, I will make the recommendation for um, salaries of $166,861 expenses of $24,205 for a total of $191,066. To be revisited Thursday. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for your work on this and for stepping up to present it. And that brings us to our warrant article hearings and potential votes. Uh, first, we have article D, the report of the personnel board. Uh, Alan, I turn it over to you. Alan, you're on mute. There's a bug. Sorry about that, gang. I don't know what we missed. Hmm? You missed some really insightful comments <laughs> that cannot be recaptured. So I'm sorry. So one time thing, but I actually uh, it was it was really that I didn't I neglected that this was the first one. I didn't print out my uh, my most recent copy. Um, the 
the, the just people are familiar with the, the personnel board. Um, the, the big item in this year's um, version is the inclusion of the salary and wage classification study, which is a two year effort uh, that the personnel board led, obviously, along with the support from, from Tom and Michelle um, and Lisa Campbell. Um, that is the, and I'm, I'm doing one without my notes here. Um, they looked at all the, it was the first time since the early 2000s they'd looked at the non union, non contract, sort of uh, quote unquote professional employees of, of the town. Um, they looked at 88 positions, uh, did a review of the responsibilities given that position, the decisions made, the, the background called for in hiring, uh, and a comparison to the uh, our, our peer towns, our regular set of peer towns, to see how those roles and functions were handled in those communities, and uh, came up, and, and, then, and also what the salary was for those positions. Uh, again, with the goal of, of having Hingham be uh, in, the, in the middle, uh, sort of uh, at the median. Uh, and so in a review of all that, uh, they came up with, they reclassified and regrouped the positions. And uh, the resulting impact is that recommendation of a $140,000 impact uh, for article Four, which is, is for the personal board adjustments uh, and then subsequently be rolled into subsequent years, Article 6s. How's that? <laughs> A great start. Thank you for your work on this. About how many different employees, just to order a magnitude, are, 88. are, are, having, are, are all 88 having their salary adjusted? Oh, oh, how many were actually changed? I'm sorry. Um, I don't know that. I don't, I know they reviewed 88 and-, and um, Your report, uh, Alan, says that it doesn't specify the, <clears throat> the number, but it, it says that the resulting change to the classifications have a total year one impact, financial impact of increasing the payroll by 144, 169. I did know that. I think I referenced that, but, but yeah. yes, I don't know how many people out of the 88 that adjusts. Sue, you have your hand up. Only only because I was part of it. Um, uh -huh. e everybody's uh, salary, no one went down and most everybody was equivalent to what they are now. They just changed the whole um, salary schedule um, grades and steps. So I think there were uh, less than 20 that actually um, got adjusted up. Most people, most, people, most people went on to the new schedule and now we'll have more steps to go, go for. I should have assumed you were part of it, so I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. I'm always behind the scenes there, Ellen. Right, right. Other members of advisory with uh, questions, comments? The, um, uh, yeah, the, the uh, total uh, amount resulting from um, uh, the adoption of uh, Article 4, is it? Yes. Is 705,306. That, that includes some one year extensions of collective bargaining agreement. Is that? It does. That's exactly. That's it's the the um, I, I, li I list them there. The the police superiors office union, the Hingham Patrolmen's Association, the library staff, and public works folks. Yes, it's um, still article still article D, but we presume it's going to become article four. Yes, yes. and it, it also includes all non union contracts. Everybody gets a two percent uh, cola raise in July. Uh, <laughs> Is that in the forecasts, Bob? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. I hope the the uh, town accountant was one of the twenty who got bumped, but I, you know, I wasn't on the 
review committee. So, well, remember, we're working on her trip to Hawaii. <laughs> and, and, and she's not, she wasn't part of the wage and classification study. <laughs> Victor, did you have a question? Um, I, I just want to, to ask, um, Alan, is the, is the report out? Have you read the report? I did not read the full report and, uh, or, the, or the actual contracts that are associated with it. All goes, um, it is all publicly filed. Uh, I did not read the full report, no, or the summary. It's available now, I and mean, they, they've done their report. Yes. Okay. Any other members of advisory with questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Any members of other town boards or member of the public with a question or comment? Uh, are we prepared to vote? Ellen? Um, I think the recommended motion is in essentially the identical form that it follows every year. So if there is anything- well, the, only things I, the only things I amended um, are the, the total amount of the appropriation to the 705,000 and the effective, date, the effective date of the wage and classification study is actually June 1st. Uh, the, typically that language is July 1st of that, of the current year, um, but the classification study actually goes in by virtue of that agreement goes into effect on June 1st. Right. So Want me to read the recommended motion. I don't, I don't think we need to read it. Um, okay. We all, we all have it. We've, we've all seen it um, uh, year in and year out. I think Alan has flagged the changes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, oh, just a come? question. So yes, with, the June, with the June 1st date, does that mean there's a fiscal 20, um, whatever the current year is, 21 in time? Yes, there will be. And actually, we have money in Article 4 still available to use it. Okay. In the existing Article 4? Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Then we'll come to vote. Julie. Julie has a question. Julie, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just want to make a quick comment that, that this was a big lift for the personnel department this year. And they talked about it in the Board of Selectmen meeting and for also Michelle Monsegur and for Lisa Campbell. So just wanted to say thank you. Two year effort. Yeah. Okay. Now we come to vote. Davaline. Aye. George. Aye. Alan. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Julie. Aye. Brenda? Aye. Victor? Aye. Dave? Aye. Tina? Aye. Erin? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Evan? Aye. Andy? Aye. Libby? Aye. I think I got everybody. I'm upset I got the mug. That should be 14-0. That's <laughs> what I got, Bob. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Yes, <clears throat> and that will bring us to Article E, Salaries of Town Officers. And Kristen, I think that's yours. Um, so this is the, for the salaries of town officers. Um, the amounts have not changed since the prior year. Um, they've been flat for years and consistent with other towns. The only change to the recommendation from last year is similar to what Alan um, talked about was with the wage and classification study. Um, the town clerk is now, will, will if it passes, um, Ju June 1st will be a grade 10 versus um, last year was a grade 15. So that's just in the parentheses there, if that is to pass. Um, everything else remaining the same from last year. Questions or comments from members of advisory? Questions or comments from um, members of any other town board or members of the general public? I'm not seeing yeah. any. Yeah. Thank you. Bob, Bob, can I make a quick comment on, on uh, articles E and, and D? <clears throat> uh, I was on the personnel board many years ago for a long time and uh, 
it was the, my, it's my understanding the personnel board is the one that uh, initiated this idea of looking at uh, what have been come to be called the benchmark towns, primarily uh, to see, of course, what, what other towns are paying for the similar or same positions. And that's, that's a very good indicator and helps a lot uh, for that purpose. Uh, the a comparison to benchmark towns is not necessarily a good indicator in lots of other circumstances uh, in which uh, uh, comparisons are often sought, period. End of my remarks. Thank you. Yeah, the personnel board for years has done an excellent job serving the town uh, with respect to all of its functions. And we thank them. Um, there are no further comments. I think this again is a recommended motion that we've seen many, many times. It's been circulated to everybody. I don't know that we need a formal reading of it. Kristen has flagged the, the only change really for this year. Uh, is there a second to the recommended motion? Second. Then we'll come to vote. Uh, Dave Lane. You're on mute. I just wanted to see the mug. I. <laughs> George, George. Hi. <laughs> Alan. Come on. Yeah, I. <laughs> Nancy. I. Julie. I. Linda. I. Victor. I. Dave. I. Tina. Aye. Aaron. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Evan. Aye. Andy. Aye. Libby. Aye. Okay. That's everyone. So we have 14-0. Um, then we have next on our agenda, Article K, transfer of funds to the reserve fund. Um, this will ultimately be a supplemental recommendation at um, uh, town meeting. So uh, and this is Victor's article. Um, Victor, why don't you go ahead? We're really just reviewing the comments so we can put it in the warrant. So, so this, thank you, Bob. This is a perennial. Uh, we have it in case the reserve fund is inadequate to close out the year, so it would be fiscal 21. And we don't know until closer to town meeting uh, what amount, if any, we would need to add to the reserve fund. The reminder of the fiscal 21 reserve fund is at $629,100 was the approved amount last year. And Sue tells me so far we have spent nothing. Um, Sue also advises that some um, budgets are in deficit. Uh, some of those deficits are due to COVID and we are expecting reimbursement for those hopefully before the end of the fiscal year. Um, but there are, you know, at this point we can't tell whether we will need a reserve, uh, additional money into the reserve fund um, or, or not. So that's, uh, that's basically it. Comments or questions from members of the advisory? Comments or questions from other town boards or members of the general public? And we will actually vote this when we know the amount uh, <clears throat> at a meeting closer in time to uh, the town meeting. So we will proceed to Article Q, the citizen petition for gender neutral terms. Dave Lane. Okay, so um, I wanted to say a few things in my introduction and then I'll go through my comment and the recommended uh, motion at the end and then take questions that people might have. Um, I've had conversations with several of you um, in, and also some people who aren't on ADCOM uh, that have raised questions. And so I've tried to answer those in what we've done. And I, um, so I wanna thank everyone for their comments and help. And I think we've ended up with a probably an even better recommended motion, but I'm biased in that sense, I guess, since, since I'm the one that's drafted at this point. So I do wanna begin by just reminding people that language does change over time. 
And I think the proposed changes really recognize that um, progression and would make our town bylaws and communications more welcoming and exclusive, uh, or excuse me, inclusive of diversity. Um, some of the new language, I, I thought about some of the comments that people made. Well, it didn't really bother me if somebody said, you know, selectmen, even though our selectmen have been women or chairman, even though I'm a woman or whatever. Um, and I think gendered language may not make someone feel excluded, but gender neutral language makes them feel included. And that's a very, I think, important thing. And I just wanna highlight, I've shared with a couple of you um, a story that to me came up as we were talking the other night um, about how we don't really even realize the impact of language. And when I was um, planning to go to law school, my then five-year-old cousin, who was like an, a miniature Alex Keaton, so I'm dating myself with that reference, but um, he heard his parents talking about I was going to law school, and he came to ask me uh, if that was true, and I said I was. And he looked very confused and said, so will you be a lawyer? And I said, yes. And he looked even more confused and said, so will you be a man? <laughs> and uh, I said, no. And he astonished, totally astonished. Now this was 30 some years ago. So hopefully he's had better role models would a kid would today. Um, and he said, so you'll be a lady lawyer? And I thought that probably wasn't the time to talk about lady versus woman or any such terms. But we, I think we don't realize how much our language actually does impact um, particularly children around us. So I think this was, would be good. Um, in terms of the draft I sent out, I tried to highlight what I had um, changed and I did send out an additional draft today. So one of the things I've tried to make clear um, is that we are talking about current and future communication. Um, we're not talking about things that are simply in our historical past and are no longer relevant. Um, so I tried to do that. I have added a sentence um, to make clear that sometimes it's actually not necessary to refer to gender at all. And one of the, the things in the original recommended motion is we didn't really make clear that there was an option actually to, to uh, write a sentence so that gender was not referenced at all because it wasn't needed. Um, in the actual language, the town clerk's position, that's been done, if, if you will. Um, I also tried to highlight in more detail this idea that it's town committees and boards and departments that are responsible uh, for doing this work and that there is no, and they're responsible for doing it as time and resources permit, um, that it is a process and what, and that is what the article um, intends in that sense. And I've also added because of a question that someone raised, could this be used as an opportunity, uh, particularly with respect to special acts, which I'll come back to uh, in the recommended motion as well, to change other parts of that act. And so I wanted to make clear as sort of the legislative history that what this really changes is the gender neutral language and not other things. So it's not a um, open season to change things that would otherwise need approval substantively at town meeting. Um, so in the recommended motion itself, um, I have changed the paragraph that begins to delete the words he, she, his or her, um, to the end of that sentence says, and replace with a gender neutral reference if necessary. And simply what I mean by that is if we're referencing, for example, the animal control officer, then we don't need a gender neutral reference. And so that's just to allow that um, replacement, if you will, in that sense. Um, if we drop down a couple of paragraphs, Andy had made a suggestion for a uh, a longer version of um, this idea of the select board uh, and being uh, rep um, representing all of the powers and et cetera of the previous board of selectmen. Um, John Coughlin and I discussed that. We did add Andy's language about constitution and added general to laws, um, but this is really a concise version that takes care of that and so, uh, after consulting with John Coughlin, we left it as it is. 
be except for that change. Um, let's see, the other thing, uh, there's nowhere in the, by, in the proposed change where it says you could in fact use a person pronoun, okay? <laughs> um, that you could use a personal pronoun if in fact you knew that person's pronoun, it was specific to them and it would be the kind of thing you would do. So um, I was thinking if the Board of Selectmen were to, for example, honor a citizen, um, that's a specific individual. And if that person's pronoun is, is known and, and used, you wouldn't want to say you have to use gender neutral language when in fact the person has a gender in that context. So that's um, what that was, um, was added to do. Um, the final part, I think, and then I'll take whatever, um, well, I guess two other things. Um, there was some discussion of um, if we would know sort of what the intent was in the legislative history in some way. So I think the comment is designed to sort of help us understand that. But if we also look at um, the new provisions for Article 3, 4, 5, and 6, taken together, they make clear this is an intention. Um, this is a change that takes place. And if we don't get it right, Section 6 of Article 1 basis basically says any um, reference to one gender shall be construed to include all genders. So uh, I think that's important. The last part um, to address was the, the question that arose about special acts. So um, as soon as the meeting was over, it occurred to me that one of the reasons the Town Administrator Act is mentioned is it is actually the special act that's in the bylaws. So it is one of the articles in the bylaws that there are no, I, I don't believe there are any other special acts referenced in the bylaws themselves. Uh, but in talking with John Coughlin about this particular point, um, the Town Administrator Special Act is used in the day-to-day -day running of, of Hingham's government. It is constantly referenced, constantly used, and therefore it's very important that that Special Act be appropriately changed. Um, somehow we got into the idea that there was only maybe a couple of other Special Acts, and the library one was mentioned. There are numerous Special Acts in Hingham, far too many to be noted individually. Um, in, the, in this uh, recommendation, according to John Coughlin. And in fact, some of, them, some of them are historical only. So they wouldn't, I think, under my understanding of the bylaw fall in, uh, change fall in anyway. But the, many of them are used only rarely. And so it would probably not be worth, if, if you hardly ever use anything, the expense of going to the legislature to change it in that context. So. Um, that's why I've left that language as it is after talking um, to John Coughlin. So I think that's what I have to say. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks for a lot of great work on that, Dave Wayne. Um, any questions or comments from members of advisory? I, I just wanted to, to thank you, Dave Wayne, for going back and, you know, digging into the questions that, that were raised. Appreciate that. You're welcome. And Nancy McDonald. Uh, Dave Lane, great job. Um, I, I just had a question about the last sentence of the, I mean, the last paragraph of the comment. Um, and I was wondering why that was included in the, the vote um, paragraph as opposed to in the comment itself. And it, does it mean anything that it's in a different place, what the Board of Selectmen asked? Um, my reason for putting it there was they, they stated that as part of their vote. Um, and I, it could be read that they were voting in favor of it contingent upon that provision that they were asking the advisory committee to do. Which explains why it would be in the recommendation. I, ju I just thought it was interesting. I've never, I've, I've never seen the Board of Selectmen do that. So Okay. Uh, I mean, so I, that's why I included it. I thought they made that request. And I thought if people think it's not, you know, shouldn't be there, I'm happy to take it out. But it seemed to me that was. Um, I, have, I, I have no opinion one way or the other. It's just that it stands out because I've never seen it 
done like that before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Libby. Thank you. Um, Dabling, question on page two. Um, under section one of references, chapter 260 of the act, the special act. Um, but then I noticed the recommendation references 263, and I wasn't sure if the recommend, uh, recommended motion was correcting. Um, the recommended something. motion is correcting the original proposal. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure that was intentional. And then I know it came up, I think it might have been. Um, the Board of Selectmen's meeting, because I did listen to their presentation when this article was um, before them. And I don't know, um, was there any discussion of the cost and does the whole idea that this can be done as time permits take take um, that into consideration? It, it does. And I think Libby at our last meeting when this was discussed, um, um, Kate Boland, I believe it was from the league mentioned that when that they had a hard time actually trying to get costs from towns that had done this. Uh, clearly there are costs, they seem to be one time cost. Uh, but but she pointed out when she had spoken to I believe it was situate that they had said on things like their letterhead, which of course eventually you'd change, they were just going to keep using the old letterhead till they needed new letterhead and then they would make the change. Um, so um, but beyond that, they couldn't really get a, a handle on what the cost would be. I tried to figure out what would you have to change. And so those are the things um, that are mentioned. Ooh. And individual committees and boards, I mean, it could also involve some legal cost. So, but it's really hard to have an, uh, of what that will be. So. Julie. Just a quick thing in the first paragraph of the comment, Davaline. You have in the first sentence that it's a citizen's petition prepared and supported by the Hingham League of Women Voters. And maybe the league members on this meeting could correct me if they want it differently, but I think that we usually refer to ourselves as League of Women Voters of Hingham. So okay. it's a tiny little thing, but. Happy to change that. And of course the petition itself, organizations can't submit petitions. So that's why it's still a citizen's petition from the named individuals, but I'm happy to change it to the League of Women Voters of Hingham. That's Is that going to be changed to the League of Voters, Julie? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Okay, any further questions or comments from members of the advisory? I think Nancy, in answer to your question, uh, the generic review is included because usually when we amend bylaws, we actually write them all out. And, and the task of doing that with this particular amendment would be impossible. Yeah, and I should say just in, in the interest of transparency here, I have gone through the annotated red line version that the league um, prepared. And I actually, because when I first started working on this, I thought that's what we were gonna have to do was have the entire bylaws. So I had annotated and made some changes where for example, you could eliminate gender from a sentence or something like that. And my intention, it, it, even though I didn't finish that because it became clear that's not what we were going to do. I am going to finish my own sort of review of the red line version and I will give that to, to the town um, for their consideration. Yeah, that's uh, a great who it, was great it Liza, Liza O'Reilly who led that effort of the initial review of all the bylaws. That was, uh, yes. that was quite an undertaking. Thank you. Uh, I think Victor has a question. Uh, so, if, Bob, I, I, since I had raised a number of questions uh, the other day, I want to thank Davaline for uh, making uh, a number of changes here that do respond to my concerns. Um, and while uh, I still question the wisdom of whether to regulate communications in a bylaw, I'm I'm supportive of the, the bylaw has changed. So thank you, Davaline, for uh, your work on this. Well, thank you, Victor. It, I think it made a better, I think it actually made a better um, recommended motion. And Julie. 
Oh, I just wanted to come up with a better answer for Andy's question. You know, there are actually men who are members of the League of Women Voters of Hingham. So Andy, we'd love to have you join us as a member if you'd like to. So long as you don't meet in Bear Cove Park. Yeah, sorry, no, there's no bathroom right now. Yeah, so yeah. Before this gets too far the, uh, off the rails, um, but any further invitation. questions or comments from members of advisory? Uh, questions or comments from uh, other town boards or members of the public? I'm not seeing any hands. And Dave Lee, I recognize this recommendation is a page and a half long. <laughs> um, it's not something we see every year. Uh, I don't know that we need a verbatim reading of it, but I think if you gave us at least a high level overview of what each of the uh, parts of this recommendation are accomplishing, that would be useful. All right. So uh, the recommendation is that the town amend the general bylaws for the town of Hingham um, to change basically the board of selectmen to the select board uh, and to make other changes in terms of select board members or uh, as needed. Um, that the use of chairman will be replaced with the word chair. Um, that words he, she, his, her, et cetera, uh, will be replaced with a gender neutral reference if necessary. Um, that the town clerk provision will be changed to reference the town clerk and not by gender at all. Um, that added to article one of the bylaws will be sections four, five, and six, which make clear uh, in terms of the history that what is now the, at, upon approval, what is now the select board was what used to be the board of selectmen and nothing has changed in terms of their powers, if you will. Um, that in uh, current communications and future communications, we will work towards gender neutral or we will use gender neutral terms um, and that we will over time make this review in all of our committees as time and resources permit. Um, and uh, words of one gender when they appear in the town of Hingham bylaws are construed to mean all genders. And beyond that, we've authorized uh, the board of selectmen to uh, review the bylaws once they are completed and to make any additional grammatical changes and to file a completed version of the bylaws with the town clerk. And again, that's um, grammatical changes, not otherwise substantive changes. And also it authorizes the board of selectmen to file a petition with the general court regarding the town administrator special act and any other special acts which would be appropriate to do so. How's that? Is that that's, a, that's an excellent, uh, perfect <laughs> summary of the recommendation. Thanks again and thanks to the league. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second. All right, then we come to vote. Uh, Dave Aline. Aye. Uh, Alan. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Julie. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Victor. Aye. Dave. Aye. Tina. Aye. Aaron. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Evan. Aye. Our newest member of the league, Andy. Libby? Aye. George? Aye. I think that's 14 to zero too. Thank you. And again, thanks to everyone who had comments and, and, um, and helped. And also, of course, thanks to the league for bringing this forward. And thanks to the members of the league who are here tonight. Great job. On to town meeting. Um, and that will bring us to Article U, Plymouth River School Window Authorization to Borrow. Um, we're only reviewing the comment tonight because as we discussed at an earlier meeting, uh, this too will be a supplemental uh, recommendation uh, at the town meeting to be determined by a later vote of the advisory committee once we get closer to town meeting. 
So Dave, this is yours. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's much more to say. Like we've talked about it a few times. It's rather straightforward. I've uh, stripped the previous version of the comment of um, my brackets around the to be determined amount. And now I'm express about that. And then just have changed the, uh, there is no recommended motion. Well, I guess, I guess, no, there isn't. It, it, I, I checked the format. I think that's consistent with how we've done it with other articles where we've made a later recommendation. Um, I guess the only question I would have, which this group doesn't have to opine on, is whether we include that highlighted after it is received the estimate or not. And typically, it's usually just said we'll make our recommendation at town meeting. Um, but I'd welcome any comments on the comment itself, um, as that's really that's all bef all before us tonight. Well, I thought it was an excellent comment for a, a project that. Uh, is important to the Plymouth River School and its community. Um, we all saw the terrible condition the windows were in and it's it's great that hopefully we'll get this done. Good. Any, any other questions or comments from members of advisory? Questions or comments from uh, members of the public or other town boards? I don't see any, so thank you, Dave. Sure, thank you. Now that brings us then to Article W, Transfer Harbor Revenues to Municipal Waterways Fund. And Libby's done a lot of work on this and for which we thank her. Libby, the floor is yours. Okay, so as you all know, we've already heard this article. I think the question that came up was how the recommended motion should be worded, um, given that uh, each of these uh, three categories um, are, are basically in, in different places right now. So um, I kind of streamlined the comment and you can see from the draft that you got um, that um, as far as the additional amounts that we're depositing is the uh, remaining 50%, uh, of, which is projected to be $35,000. That is um, currently for the fiscal 21 budget in local receipts. Um, and the um, one of the big, I guess, questions that um, also came up was the revenues generated from the parking license, um, which is projected to be $40,000. Um, so what I added was if and when received, um, the town has not received that yet. So this is kind of a catch all so that if um, when um, when the lease is finalized and this town receives the money that it will then be included. Um, it is currently not in the budget and then the final amount uh, which is um, the revenues uh, for permit late fees and or boating fines. That is, um, those monies have currently been deposited in the waterways fund, um, but they do um, require a town meeting vote to do so. So the paragraph underneath indicated that based on where those current monies uh, are, that um, I think we had discussed what in, if there was going to be a budget impact so it's only the $35,000 um, that is currently um, in local receipts that would reduce the surplus for fiscal 21. Uh, and as we all know, the goal here um, on the initial um, statutory pieces that are noted in paragraph one, as well as three, these three pieces are to, um, as the last paragraph states, to set these monies aside in this waterways, um, uh, the waterways fund, uh, in order to uh, provide a source for our appropriations for harbor um, related matters. So as you can see from the recommended motion um, that is somewhat follows the, the comment now is that um, these are for amounts that are through June 30 of 21, the current fiscal year that we're in and noting that um, I guess I can go through the recommended motion or just make that motion at this point, Bob, rather than continuing to go through. It's a little bit repetitive of what I just stated. So why not, maybe I'll turn it back to you and then when you're ready for the recommendation at that point, I'll go through it. I just wanted uh, to know, uh, Sue, uh, as I understand it, you are in accord with the, the form of the recommended motion? Yes. Okay. And are uh, there questions or comments from members of advisory? Uh, Victor. So, so I, I, I guess just a, a comment on the 
comment on the sort of the last paragraph before the, the description of the vote. It, it, let me, it may be you, you streamlined it a little too much because I, I, I don't think that that's clear to, going to be clear to, to just the general reader as to the estimate for whose fiscal 21 budget and you know, the also, I think you should say for, for appropriations from the waterways fund, well, for what? You, I mean, in your discussion just now, you said for harbor related improvements, but I, I think it could be beefed up a bit. Yeah, I can. T I actually had quite a, a large paragraph that kind of went through all the different types of statutory um, appropriations, but I felt that given that that wasn't part of this article, it wasn't necessary, but I can certainly just add up, add in, um, you know, a sentence that, that gets a little bit more specific about what those appropriations um, are. And then as far as the beginning part of the sentence, um, Victor, is there some recommendation that you have for um, what wording you think would, would be more clear? Current estimate of the of impact of, for the town's fiscal 2021 budget projects a surplus, if that's, if that's what you're trying to say. So yeah, it's the current estimate for the town's fiscal 2020, 2021 um, budget. So I can just add the town's 2021 and budget. Um, although I use the, use the word estimate because if you look at uh, what we put in the, in the um, warrant, it's, it's once we get past the budget stage, now the numbers are estimates. Okay. So it's, it's the town's, um, so I can say if you'd like the current, um, well, it is, it's the estimate. It's, it's now beyond a budget because now we're in the current fiscal year and these are estimates well, for where we're gonna end up. Can you just simply say that the town's uh, fiscal year 2021 uh, budget uh, projects a surplus? Yep. Yeah, that would work. Okay. So I'll just take out the words current estimate for. Yeah. So it will be the town's fiscal 2020, 2021 budget projects a surplus. Yeah. Is that, is that meet your, does that make that work for you, Victor? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, as long as it's accurate. Yep, it is. Sue, do you have any um, problem with that? I do not. Okay. Julie. Okay, so I just wanna make sure that I have it right that when the town sets the budget for the next year and forecasts the uh, excise tax for boats, it's $35,000. It's a total of 70,000, 70, 35 of which is uh, deposited into the waterways fund. And again, that's part of the statutory piece. The other 50% is what we're talking about here, and that would be in local receipts. So this, this article is done at the, at, at the end, I won't say every year because um, it isn't always every year, um, but it really should be because I think the whole idea here is to capture all the waterways related funds into that account so that there's a source for um, appropriations. But the if you look at that, the local, receipts page, which is, I think the last page maybe of the budget. Um, if you look at this, yep, second line down, it says other excise, you'll see that's $35,000. So that's this piece that we're talking about that that needs to go to a town meeting vote because the very definition of um, the fund when it was set up is that that's not automatic, it requires town meeting approval. Okay, so it always be gonna, going to be forecast at half the amount because the other half will go into when it is approved by town meeting would go into that waterways fund. It's, all, well, it's always been forecasted for half, Julie. Okay. So Great. the half, the half that's, that's, that's by statute is not appear on the budget because it's on the balance sheet, if you will, in the waterways fund. This piece of it is, is put on local receipts and does require a town meeting vote as well as the the um, all three of these categories that I've noted require town meeting vote because they're not part of the statute. Great, thank you. Andy, did you have another question? I, I had I had a, a couple of stylistic changes that I very belatedly 
after seven o'clock email to Libby and Nancy, and I just run through them quickly. It'll take two minutes. In the comment, I would put the before 2019, and I would put town between annual and meeting. So that paragraph, the first sentence of the comment would read the 2019 annual town meeting. Yeah, actually, that I'm not sure why that wasn't there unless it somehow got inadvertently deleted. But you're no, we'll correct. capture the editors will capture that sort of thing, Andy. Yes. Okay, and then I put a. That won't get by Nancy. Uh, I put a comma after 5G section 5G in that sentence and changed in order to be eligible to in order uh, to make the town eligible. In the next sentence, I changed statutorily to pursuant to section 5G. Um, in the uh, next paragraph, the second bullet point, revenue, revenue is generated from any park and license, parking and license. And I wonder if you need the word fees in there. So it'd be uh, sure. from any parking and license fees. Um, and that, that same change would get would get made in the recommended motion as well. The third line down on the right parking license just add fees. Yep, I'm just looking at the question on that and seeing how they worded that. Yeah, they didn't put that in the question, but um, Bob, is that a problem to put it in the recommendation even though it's not in the question? Yeah. Bob? I wouldn't think it's a problem though. Okay. But is, isn't Andy talking about the comment? He, right now he's talking about the recommend recommendation. So yeah. after the on the third line down where it ends in parking license, he's saying add the word fee, which is not in the question. So I just I've always um, All tried right. to well, say. I guess I've got a question. Um, is the town licensing to the marina operator parking spaces that the for, for one fee, or is this an, an aggregation of people coming in and paying 20 bucks to park their trailer for the day? It's one lease for, for, the, for the year, or for a three year lease. So is it, so, would you call it, Sue, would you call it then a license fee? I, I think fee um, then in the singular is more accurate. Yeah, it's, it's one, it's one, um, one lease. And Bob, that's all um, and I think Andy's uh, recommending is to just add the word fee after parking license in the comment and the recommendation, even though the, the question just calls it a parking license. So if, if there's no objection, then I could just add that. Yeah, fee or payment is either one would be fine. The, the last change I had is just the line above that in the recommended motion. I just changed the date to write it out as June 30, 2021, rather than the CPA's abbreviation. Uh, yeah, actually, I think you asked that last time, uh, Council. I think we said that that's how it was in previous warrant articles, but I will put whatever, if there's a preference, Bob. I, I think our editors have a convention for that. All right, we will leave that to Nancy. That's all I have. Nice job and, and streamlining it, Libby. That was a tough one. So it was a little one, but it was. Libby, you want to give us a quick recommended motion? Okay, yes. Um, I'd like to make a recommendation that the town vote to transfer the following sums, which were generated from fees paid to the town through June 30th, 2021. 50% of the vote excise taxes, estimated to be $35,000. I'm not gonna read every word, but from local receipts, uh, parking license fee for the purpose of accessing the slips, approximately $40,000 if and when received, and revenues generated by the Harbor Master's Office, estimated to be $10,000 for deposit into the Municipal Waterways Improvement Maintenance Fund. Is there a second? Second. All right, we come to vote. Uh, Davaline? Aye. Sue? I'm uh, not Sue. Alan? <laughs> oh, Nancy? Aye. 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 Brenda? Aye. Victor? Aye. Dave? Aye. Tina? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Kristen? Aye. 
Evan, you're on mute. You're on mute. Aye. Andy. Aye. Libby. Aye. George. Aye. I think I've got 14 zero there too. I'm going to add my eye because I don't, I think I, you missed me. Did I do that? <laughs> Sorry, Julie. I, I'm going picture by picture. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Libby, for a lot of good work on that. Thank you, Sue, for your assistance. Um, that brings us to Article Y, the HMLP transmission and substation distribution facilities. And Erin, I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, great, thank you. So first of all, I thought I would bring everybody up to date to uh, where we are right now. So first off, I'd like to thank the HMLP team as well as the neighbors on Old Hobart Street. Um, I thought I'd just recap you know, what we've heard over very briefly um, during our previous meeting, um, because I think it's important that we as advisory understand some of the genesis of this article. Um, so, you know, I, I have learned that, you know, we need a second substation and we need redundant transmission lines. Um, I believe that we need to take action towards climate policies and not just set goals. Um, and that increased demand for electrification is an eventuality. The redundant substation needs to be proximal to the existing substation. Um, and then it's fiscally responsible for the town to evaluate the parcels that it owns within um, in order to enable a project such as this. Um, these parcels are few and far between because we are becoming a more developed town, um, especially because of the good work that we've done in order to protect some of our properties, both from a conservation perspective, open space, recreation, and so forth. Um, so we need to be mindful of that when evaluating uh, parcels of land. We also heard about how some substations are um, you know, in densely populated areas, such as Cambridge, how they can be made to look like the streetscape in which they are, um, where they're residing. So, uh, you know, and I believe that it, the HMLP team is acting in good faith. And I think that they are thinking of the benefits of its 10,600 and growing um, customers. Yet uh, this weekend, I know many of us took an opportunity to walk the parcel, the zero Hobart parcel, um, and drive down old Hobart Street. And I left the parcel with questions. Um, the questions being, um, you know, when the team at HMLP evaluated other areas, such as within the transfer station, close to the Greenbush right of way, areas down along what we, we've returned, referred to as the Spirito construction site. You know, what analysis was done? Did, was the analysis of a smaller substation evaluated? You know, I know that we, we took at, as the assumptions that there was a 20,000 square foot um, substation requirement. Um, but going back to the comment about the urban areas, it seems as though, um, you know, if we're electrifying those urban areas, that's certainly being done in less than a 0.78 um, parcel of land. So there's a lot of detail in the materials that we've been provided, um, but I think what has become more apparent and has become, um, you know, it, it, this ever evolving project is that, um, again, going back to my opening statement that you, we do need these, this redundancy and we will have an increase in electrification. Um, but Paul and his team um, at HMLP have continued to look at parcels, additional parcels, and 
you know, as of this evening, um, talk about moving pieces here. As of this evening, um, there have been parcels that may in fact be viable. It's way too early to say whether they will be, um, but in, its er in early stages of um, evaluation. But with that, um, I'm gonna recommend that we vote no action on this article. Uh, we had a very lengthy discussion uh, last week on this, but if there are, is further discussion, further questions or comments from members of advisory committee? Um, uh, Libby. I would just add, I was not at the meeting, but I did listen to it um, in its entirety. Um, and um, I think there was a lot of good information that was provided. And I think that unfortunately, um, and that's probably the, the sort of rub with this article is that the way it is, the way it is written is that it is being tied to, to that parcel. And I definitely feel as though um, there are probably some other um, potential viable alternatives for the, for the substation and that what I really took from it is that um, it seemed there wasn't a lot of um, notice, whether it was to a butters, even just working with Weymouth. And so um, I did not have the, um, wasn't able to contribute to our conversation on Thursday night. So I just kind of wanted to echo some of what I heard from my colleagues as far as other locations um, and uh, I guess all of the, reasons that people kind of had some concerns with um, this article. So um, I appreciate all the work you did on this, Aaron. And I think the comments and from everybody that I heard on Monday night, going back and listening to it, I think were really fruitful. I myself, I and, and, and have, have similar concerns to probably um, what I heard. And so I um, thank you for all your work, Aaron, and your recommendation, because I think um, it's spot on. Uh, other questions or comments from members of advisory? Victor. So Aaron, just to, to clarify, so are you envisioning then during the next year that HMLP will continue its evaluation of sites and then come back next year with either this site or some other site proposed? Is that what you're expecting? Um, I am taking it one step at a time, I think is the, the, the short answer to that question, Victor. I think that um, that certainly is a reasonable path. Um, I think that um, the the timing of this is is going and it is quite tight to do anything but that. Um, but um, I think I'm looking at it in terms of what's in front of us, in the sense that what's in front of us is the you know zero Hobart, and as far as I'm concerned, there is a a, a no action there. Um, it would take quite a Herculean effort, um, I think, to do anything other than have this be evaluated in, you know, the following um, town meeting. Um, but I wouldn't want to speak on anybody's behalf on that front. Uh, there were uh, quite a few phone calls in the waning hours of the day today, Victor, about uh, parliamentary options about a town-owned uh, piece of land that's under discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul, I will say to you that um, uh, John Coughlin uh, and I spoke and John thought that you might be able to operate in moving forward if you could come to an appropriate uh, memo of understanding that would provide sufficient assurance to those you were dealing with of uh, the ability of the town to make a transfer of a parcel of property. I'm happy to discuss that further with you, maybe not tonight, um, but um, in the next few days. But I, I think Victor, to answer your question, there are a number of paths forward. 
there's always the option of a special town meeting. Um, but the, uh, the time frame that we're under now puts a lot of constraint on the process. So um, questions or comments from any other members of advisory? Um, questions or comments from the proponents or other members of town boards of the general public? I'm not seeing any hands. So I think then, Aaron, I take it uh, you, you should make your recommended motion. Okay, I recommend that we take no action on this article. And is there a second? Second. Then we will come to vote. Uh, David Lee. Aye. Uh, Ellen. Aye is agreeing there's no, mo no action, right? <laughs> yes. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Julie. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Victor. Aye. Dave. That was I. Uh, yep, I. Tina. I. Karen. I think you already got me. Okay. Kristen. Aye. Evan. Aye. Andy. Aye. Libby. Aye. George. Aye. I think I get everybody. I think that's 14-0. Um, Paul, thank you and your team for all the work you've done on this. Aaron, thanks for a, a, a long and uh, a thorough job on uh, an interesting article for the town of Ham. And I'm sure that um, we will be hearing more of this in days to come. Thanks all thank the you, butters Bob. for your involvement. If I may, I'd like to thank Erin for all her help as well. Uh, we've uh, had multiple, multiple conversations and I feel like, you know, I certainly was given the opportunity to explain where we were and what we've been doing. And um, it certainly did not fall on deaf ears. Thank you for reaching out to John Coughlin. I appreciate that. And I'm sure we'll be in touch. Great. Look forward Thanks. to talking with you. Great. Thank you. Okay. And that will then bring us to Article Triple A. Victor, you you asked me for an estimate. I gave you eight twenty, and it's now eight eighteen. Yeah, I'm impressed, Bob. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, so this is the first of two zoning articles we have, and this is the lightest zoning year in my term at an advisory. Um, I see that we have with us. Um, Gordon Carr from the um, planning board, or he was anyway, and Susan Murphy, the town real estate council, um, who will be available for um, discussion on, on both of the zoning articles if, if necessary. So triple A involves changes to the town's floodplain overlay district re regulations to meet new uh, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency requirements, and to change the flood maps, which are part of the bylaw the, the, and identify the district. Uh, the maps are um, based on FEMA flood maps. Uh, being, uh, having this floodplain district allows the town to be in the federal flood insurance program, which allows residents to purchase federally insured flood insurance. So if we don't meet the requirements of FEMA, uh, we could be kicked out of the program and Therefore, um, as a result, uh, insurance would be no longer be available. Uh, the AAA combines, for those of you who studied your um, warrant book earlier in the year, it combines the original AAA and what was C. Triple C addressed the maps, AAA, uh, some text changes that I will describe, uh, town council, um, indicated that it was appropriate since they de dealt with the same subject matter, the floodplain overlay district, it was appropriate to combine them in the one article. So that's why we just have AAA. Um, so the maps, 
you'll recall perhaps that last year we had this very similar um, proposal to update Hingham's flood maps to match recently, what we expected to be recently uh, updated federal maps. Because of the COVID situation, FEMA withdrew the maps last year. So we had to pull the article. Uh, and I think if I recall correctly, we did that at town meeting. We had proposed um, in the warrant that went to press, we had a recommended motion to adopt the new maps, but that was put off. Um, now they're back. The maps will be going into effect this July. So the article proposes to change Hingham's maps to, uh, to match. The text changes, FEMA um, has a number of regulations which direct what need to be in a municipality's um, floodplain regulations, how to control development in flood floodplains. That's the real uh, gist of the regulations to regulate uses which could increase the flood hazard. Um, FEMA recently revised those regulations and is requiring that municipalities update their bylaws. Uh, the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and um, Recreation, which is the state's flood um, liaison, as it, if you will, developed a model bylaw for to help municipalities do this. Uh, these requirements came out sort of just at the end of the fall. So it was a bit of a scramble to um, for the planning staff to come up with um, the proposal here for the planning board's review. Uh, this bulk of A AAA uh, implements those changes. We have some of the required items are in the uh, town wetlands regulations. Um, so we're not, we don't have every item that FEMA is requiring in this zoning bylaw, but these, uh, these were developed when um, principally through Lonnie Fournier going through the model bylaw, comparing it to the existing bylaw and seeing where we had gaps and they are filled in this, uh, this proposal. Let's see, and that was the proposal that was voted by the planning board. I'm proposing some minor changes, which I are in red on the version I sent around to you. Um, clarifications and similar things like that. The um, Lonnie looked at those and Susan Murphy looked at those and did not have any concern with those from, from an aspect of how FEMA would react if, uh, if they actually reviewed our bylaw. Um, I will also note that there are some, I mean, some of the changes, particularly for the lawyers who might've read this, seem silly to be in a bylaw. For example, there, are requirements in here, which is after all, this is our zoning bylaw that says the town will do certain things. Well, you know, I can see FEMA regulations saying the town will do certain things and we have to do those certain things, but to put it in our own bylaw saying we have to do certain things just seems bizarre. But, uh, but again, that's, it's a FEMA requirement. Um, it doesn't hurt anything. So that's why it's in there. Um, there may be further review on this next year uh, to fine tune some things, perhaps move some of the provisions over to the wetland side or elsewhere. Um, there wasn't enough time really to do that at this point, uh, but there's um, doesn't seem to be any harm to leave them in here. And it is a requirement of maintaining uh, participation in the flood insurance program. So I'll take questions <laughs> or I guess, uh, Bob, maybe do, do you want to ask if um, Susan, well, like like to welcome Gordon and Susan and express our appreciation for their work on this. Uh, would either Gordon or Susan like to comment? Uh, I don't think I could possibly do a better explanation than what you just got. It's uh, you're, we're trying to kind of weave some things in. And as, as Victor said, we were at the doorstep last year and they kind of pulled the maps back. Mm. Um, it really is a requirement and it's an important thing to do. So it's complicated and and as as victor said we have everything we need and 
we we learned that we didn't actually have to have it all in one place. So it can be in wetlands, it can be in zoning, and uh, but we've been able to cover the bases. Lonnie's done extraordinary work uh, with uh, with Susan on this. So um, it's uh, and appreciate Victor's uh, uh, great work and and uh, explaining it and tightening it up. Great, thank you. Any members of advisory that have a comment or a question? Uh, Andy? Yeah, I was just uh, reading through it and uh, when my head started aching, I decided to palm nails through my hand instead and it was a tremendous relief. Uh, almost as big a relief as to see, see that in section 4A that with a special permit, one a permissible use is still a duck walk. So I, I, I checked off all the boxes for me. But I think uh, Victor Gordon, the other members of the uh, planning board and Susan Murphy, this is uh, an enormously painstaking task that uh, I'm, I'm so happy that you undertook it. <laughs> Not you personally, but that someone other than I uh, undertook it and really appreciate the effort that went into it. Amen. Questions or comments from anyone else on advisory? Questions or comments from any other members of the town board or member of the general public? I'm not seeing any virtual or actual waving hands. Um, Victor, I assume you would prefer not to read the recommended motion. I would move uh, for the recommendation that's set forth in um, the um, comment and recommendation I sent out uh, the other night. A succinctly made motion. Is there a second? I would okay. second that. Okay, then we'll come to vote. Uh, Dave Oling. Aye. Alan. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Julie. Aye. Sorry. Brenda. Aye. Victor. Aye. Dave. Aye. Tina. Aye. Aaron. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Evan. Aye. Andy. Aye. Libby. Aye. And George. Aye. I think that's 14 0. Okay. Now. Is Ray Estes with us? Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Victor. And look at that, like magic, he appeared. My third meeting tonight. So that, that brings us to uh, Article DDD, Citizens Petition to Amend Zoning Bylaw Accessory Dwelling Units. Andy, this is you. Um, the, <clears throat> in uh, 2017, the town amended the uh, zoning bylaws to permit attached accessory dwelling units. So for example, if you had a uh, attached garage, uh, you could uh, convert the second floor into a living space uh, under certain, con that met certain conditions of the bylaw and a family member could live there. Um, that bylaw amendment came about after considerable study, a, uh, a committee put together by the selectmen and the planning board had looked into that issue, the issue uh, that is of permitting a, a, a accessory dwelling units uh, for some time, uh, made a report, no action uh, occurred directly upon the issuance of the report but not too long thereafter, the planning board took the issue up again on its own motion and uh, <clears throat> reviewed the report, did some further investigation and determined that uh, the uh, attached accessory dwelling units uh, would be a good idea. They, they certainly can serve the laudatory purposes of providing housing for family members uh, you know, the classic situation of the in-law suite or the uh, elderly 
uh, parent suite. Um, and also, frankly, uh, for the, uh, the young uh, couple just starting out, know, the son or the daughter, or uh, possibly a member, a family member who has some uh, disability that could be better accommodated living in close proximity to, uh, to the family. So that the, uh, the planning board recommended and the advisory committee recommended and the town adopted amendments that permitted these attached accessory dwelling units. Um, that was uh, three years ago. One of the points made by the planning board at that time was we, this, this, uh, this uh, opportunity to experience and observe attached accessory dwelling units should give us uh, some insight into what impacts there could be from permitting detached accessory dwelling units. Um, that is considered uh, by the by the planning board as a a major and and different step. A detached uh, accessory dwelling unit uh, permits uh, two um, two houses, if you will, or two dwelling units on one lot. Um, the and the, the there was a lot of concern expressed about what what the impacts that could. Be, could have on neighbors or the character of the neighborhood. The planning board uh, discussed this at uh, five uh, hearings. Uh, Mr. Estes and others, Mr. Estes was the uh, primary proponent of this citizen petition, uh, provided, um, answered all of the uh, questions the board propounded and in fact uh, did a lot of research. Um, that uh, the board suggested might be helpful to them, including surveying the so-called benchmark towns to see what other other towns were doing. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Estes has a Mr. Estes has a, a particular situation, and he was quite candid in saying that some of the changes he was recommending. So, for example, um, the limitation for attached accessory dwelling units is 30%. The square footage has to be uh, no more than 30% of the square footage of the principal dwelling unit or 750 square feet, whichever is less. And, and Mr. Essie said, you know, uh, I've measured this uh, several times and, and I really need 35%, not 30%. <clears throat> so that, you know, is an example of a change that's in here that probably given the limitation to the lesser of 700, 50 square feet is not material, but as with all the questions, Mr. Essie was very uh, transparent and candid in his responses. Um, the, I, I would say that the, the board uh, struggled mightily with this, um, very much taken with the uh, laudatory goals uh, and the good purposes that uh, accessory dwelling units could serve but uh, not satisfied that it had uh, plumbed the depths of uh, all potential impacts. At the end of the day, the planning board voted unanimously to uh, essentially uh, not recommend adoption of the amendments proposed in the citizen petition, but rather to recommend the establishment of a study committee with some very uh, specific members um, in, including, as you will see in the recommended motion, a designee of uh, a, a mem either a member of or a designee of the Council on Aging, the Commission on Disabilities, uh, Historic District Commissions. Uh, and, and, and the notion is that um, it, it would be useful for the planning board to hear from those, uh, the subsets in the town who might be particularly affected uh, or particularly benefited by um, accessory dwelling units being expanded to include detached units as well as attached units. Um, so the, at the end of the day, the planning, as I said, the planning board said, uh, let's uh, ask the advisory committee if they would uh, uh, recommend a, a study committee be established 
uh, with fairly specific uh, uh, specifications as to the membership and a very specific st uh, specification as to when its report would be due, uh, which is in, a, in no event later than October 1, uh, 2022. The idea being that if, if a uh, amendment to the bylaw comes out of this study report uh, proposing a, a expanding to detached ADUs, it could be submitted uh, for um, the annual town meeting in the spring of uh, 2023. Um, this is not the result that Mr. Estes uh, desired. Uh, he has personally looked into this uh, issue for a couple of years, has talked with the planning board about it on and off, and um, uh, thinks that uh, the planning board has indeed uh, identified all of the potential uh, impacts. So um, he, he uh, didn't see the necessity of a study committee. I don't want to speak for him tonight. I don't know what his position is tonight, but during the course of the hearings, uh, those are some of the observations uh, that the proponent made. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, my recommendation is uh, to agree with the uh, planning board um, and to uh, to pick, to give us as a town a little more time to experience attached accessory dwelling units, um, three years, uh, including one year of pandemic is not uh, much, uh, doesn't give us much experience uh, since the amendment was uh, uh, enacted in 2017, 13 permits for ex accessory dwelling units uh, have been issued uh, by the town. Um, the, uh, so my recommendation is that the advisory committee uh, substitute a motion um, for the establishment of a, 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 a accessory dwelling unit study committee uh, to, uh, as specified by the planning board. And um, the planning board will file a report which will include um, uh, it, that recommendation and uh, the material that's in my comment. I will say that, that the material in my comment is simply uh, my edited version of the planning board's uh, own report. Uh, I'm just trying to make it as clear to as possible as to what the issues were before the planning board and why um, I'm recommending the advisory, why the planning board recommended and why I'm recommending uh, that the um, uh, amendment not be uh, voted on this year, but essentially be deferred in a study committee put in place. Okay. Um, Ray Estes, would you like to comment? Good, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ray Estes, 92 Fort Hill Street, um, on behalf of the petitioner. Um, so I, I appreciate this opportunity. Obviously, uh, you know, you're in the middle of many, many late nights right now, and I completely respect that. So I'll try to be as brief as I can, but I, I did want to say just a few things. Um, you know, as Andy indicated, um, uh, my wife and I have been actively and publicly pursuing a uh, potential detached uh, ADU bylaw for about two years, um, began conversations with the planning board back in, in 2019. One thing I would point out to Andy, he mentioned 2017, the, the uh, bylaw was actually enacted in 2018. So even more recently than, than 2017. So that's something just to correct in your comment. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, you know, certainly our desire to legalize the little cottage that we have behind our main house for residential use by family members is clearly in our self-interest, as Andy indicated, that I was forthcoming about. Um, as we've explored this issue over the last couple of years, the benefit of a detached ADU bylaw to the entire town became clear um, as an additional tool to provide uh, targeted housing opportunities to residents and their families. Um, in light of recommendations of past master plans, the goals and objectives identified in the current master plan, and the draft plan itself just recently released, 
which includes recommendations uh, in connection with housing and specifically accessory dwelling units, we believe that uh, the time was right to take action um, and, and, and move, move forward uh, and take the next step in this area. Uh, and that's why we, one of the reasons why we pursued it. Um, our proposal, um, which suggests minor modifications to the existing ADU while retaining the restrictions and permitting mechanism, seeks to simply extend the existing right to an existing detached structure on the same lot as the main dwelling. We were very purposeful in, um, in, in narrowly tailor, tailoring uh, the changes that we were proposing. And we consulted with um, you know, many members of the community about this, uh, including uh, members of the planning board during the process uh, of preparing it before submission. Um, we believe that there are several properties in Hingham that might be able to benefit from the passage of this bylaw at some time. Um, those would achieve the, uh, the main objectives of, of the needs assessment conducted by the ADU bylaw committee that Andy referenced uh, was conducted a number of years ago. That being to protect property values and maintain the residential character of Hingham's neighborhoods, to allow seniors to age in place, to allow for accommodation of adult children or family members who may not be able to live independently for economic, health, or other reasons, and to discourage economic incentive for rental properties and transient renters in residential neighborhoods, which many folks in town have made it very clear they're not interested in. And we totally get that and we're on board. Um, really the main idea behind uh, our desire um, was to allow my father to come and stay with us where we don't really have space in our house to put him up comfortably or my mother-in-law um, or perhaps my sister-in-law, something like that. It was all gonna be family use um, and just so folks uh, to understand what makes it a second dwelling, a dwelling unit is bathing facilities. So if I ripped out the shower that's in the little cottage, it, I could probably get a permit and use it and it wouldn't be uh, an accessory dwelling unit. Um, so as we pursued this, we believe that extending the existing bylaw uh, to existing detached structures as proposed achieves all of the objectives I just, I just spoke about. Um, while the existing bylaw appears to have been a su success, we believe our proposal will have a greater impact and even more successful. Many homes in town could be renovated to accommodate a separate ADU within the main dwelling, but many cannot. Far more homes have a second structure on the property, whether a garage, barn, cottage, or other outbuilding that could easily be converted for residential dwelling use. Um, you know, certainly understand the many issues that were brought up during the five hearings. Um, we did have some, some very lively and substantive discussions about many of them, but there were many that we didn't have an opportunity to really uh, get into uh, in depth. And one of the things that I was disappointed about, and I'll say at the outset that my goal tonight is not to convince you or persuade you to, uh, to, to support this petition. I'm, I'm fully, I'm, 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 I'm totally comfortable with the recommendation that's, that has been recommended by planning board by, uh, and, and as Andy had mentioned, um, to pursue this with further study. Um, the, the one issue that I have with it is a lot of the reasons that were given um, for needing further study is uh, are, are the many issues that were identified that there, it was voiced that there wasn't sufficient time to explore. It was suggested that uh, it was, it felt a little rushed that there wasn't sufficient time. I, I, I felt that was a little, just not quite accurate. And I just wanted for the record to make sure that everyone knew that this is something that I started discussing with folks in the planning board over two years ago, initially was going to, uh, to, to bring this last year, but because the master plan work was underway and I was told there was a housing component included. Um, and as recently as last fall, before I submitted the petition, I was told that the draft was coming out in the fall and there was likely to be recommendations that would focus specifically on this. And maybe this was the appropriate time to bring this forward. In addition, 
there are concerns that many had had and voiced about existing second dwellings right now in town that have not even been permitted um, and are flying under the radar and evading enforcement. Um, and this was an opportunity to, to, to kind of bring those in to establish, to establish regulation and provide um, enforcement opportunity. Um, and during my discussions, uh, particularly with the assessor, it was suggested that this could be a, the benefit for the town in terms of generating additional uh, tax revenue because the property would be reassessed with a second dwelling uh, in a detached structure and that would likely lead to an increased assessment and additional tax revenue. Um, my concern was that the discussion had been going on for some time. I submitted the petition and we began the hearings in January and we did have five hearings. And we seem to be moving forward toward discussing substantive issues that were being raised. There was even a draft uh, of a revision, a potential revision prepared that unfortunately we never got to discuss. Unfortunately, the, the community, the, the planning department had some staffing issues um, that they could not control. Um, and as a result, um, you know, normally Susan Murphy, the real estate attorney, began working uh, with the staff uh, to assist throughout the whole process. And I think, I think it was just an unfortunate uh, situation where because of that and because of the concerns that were being raised, it was an easy out to say, you know what, let's study some more. I'm not suggesting that there aren't issues that, that don't warrant additional discussion or study. I'm just saying, I think that there was an opportunity to really uh, discuss this in, in greater substantive detail. And that opportunity was not pursued uh, as much as it could have. So that's, that's unfortunate. But again, I'm not suggesting that um, you, do, you do anything other than, than support Andy's uh, suggestion. Um, and, I, and I will support um, you know, further study because I think this is an important, um, I think this is an important change that should be made. Uh, as we know, the planning board suggests amendments to, to the zoning bylaw each year and every year. Um, and sometimes there are new things that get thought of that are never considered before, but many, many times there are improvements on existing bylaws. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to improve on the existing bylaw for ADUs that will provide a greater opportunity uh, to folks in town um, and a benefit uh, to many different types of, of folks in town, uh, age groups and, and whatnot that I've that I've mentioned. Um, you know, I do appreciate the opportunity. I just wanted to point, you know, those few things out. Um, you know, as, as Andy said, there were some specific changes that were uh, particular to our situation. Um, and as we kind of moved through the process and I was hoping to get some clarity on a couple of them, it may be that we didn't need those changes. But unfortunately, we never really got to follow through with more of that substantive discussion in order to flesh that out more um, for the reasons that I indicated. So I am hopeful that, that those discussions can happen in the very near future um, to pursue this topic um, and ultimately uh, bring it before town meeting in a substantive manner. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, David Lane, you've got a question or comment? I do. I have a question about the makeup of the, uh, the study committee. Um, in particular, uh, because the Affordable Housing Trust um, housing plan for the town of Hingham, the draft of which was released in December, has a specific recommendation that the town explore changing the zoning bylaws in order to permit a greater use of accessory dwelling units. And given that specific recommendation, it's surprising to me that someone from either the Affordable Housing Trust or their designee is not listed as one of the interested parties since they have the official document actually that is to explore this issue. So it seems like they should really be part of the 
the process. So I'm just wondering why they're not or why that was not considered or if it was considered and rejected. I think either Susan or I can probably try to answer that. I'll start and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Susan because we discussed that uh, a, a bit. And then I'd like to get back to um, uh, some of the elements of uh, why we're proposing a study. Um, so uh, these are designed for the, the intent of, of the original um, ADU bylaw and the intent of the stated intent of the uh, of the petitioner for this one was for family members, right? It is it is a it's a private family transaction. The Affordable Housing Trust is in the housing production business, so we were just differentiating between those two. We're not we're not setting these up as affordable units per se. They may in fact be. They're not for rental. Uh, that's that's been it's uh, been the stated case of the planning board. It was of the petitioner and was of the master plan. Um, that these are not intended to be rental units. So that's why we were more interested on the, the constituencies and the folks in town that would benefit most from it and hearing from them. So I think that's why we thought about the HAHD and didn't include it. Susan, I don't know if you have anything to add. Susan, go ahead. I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, no, I just, I wasn't sure if Gordon was gonna jump in. Um, no, I, I think what Gordon said was true. It wasn't a question of, whether or not ADUs have merit. And I think that the comment um, or the report from the planning board, which was largely incorporated by um, Andy speaks to that, you know, the board is not opposed to the concept of ADUs obviously attached because they recommended that or detached. So the value of ADUs was uh, universally um, noted by the planning board it was more the impact in, on neighborhoods um, that needed to be looked at. And also speaking to potential users, such as families with members with disabilities or um, more the aging population and ask them what they need. So for example, um, should ADUs only be restricted to the second floor above a garage? Well, people were saying if it's someone with disabilities or an elderly person, having to go upstairs may not be the best option. So trying to work with the members of the community who would most benefit from this was what was behind the um, thought process by the board in looking at the demo, the, um, the makeup of the committee. So it wasn't, it wasn't, not understanding the important role of the Affordable Housing Trust. It was just coming at the topic from a different angle, from the user angle. Um, so if that's helpful. Thank you. Bob, if I, if I could, just for a moment, um, just to provide a little bit of clarity. I know that Ray's not asking for uh, a modification, but just on behalf of my four colleagues, um, we spent, five hearings on this, trying to figure this out and trying to see how we might be able to craft a bylaw that that we were comfortable with that also accommodated the specifics of, of uh, Ray's situation. Um, he, he calls it narrow, I would say it was customized, right? And, and our concerns were that in order to accommodate what he needed, which is a detached unit, 100% of which would be the residential unit, and it might be on the first floor. It's not accessory to another unit. We had a number of questions that were raised, and we didn't. We did not have the opportunity whether um, to investigate all of those. Um, and out of respect for him and for everybody else, we wanted to find out what the best format was. I don't know if 35% is the right number or not. I don't know if 750 square feet is the right number for a detached unit. Um, rather than in the in the primary dwelling, um, but if we're gonna if we're gonna do this, I want to figure it out and make sure we're doing it right and understanding what those consequences are broadly for the town. So that's where the five of us came down. Um, we weren't able to uh, reconcile the uh, the issues that we had with the current proposal, but we do think it's important to try to get all of those other voices <laughs> heard. And craft a craft a detached ADU bylaw that works for the whole town and uh, meets the needs of a variety of constituencies that we we did not hear from um, during these hearings. Uh, we didn't we largely heard from only Ray during these hearings. So we thought it was uh, wise if we're going to take this step, which 
frankly, in my opinion, is a big step. We're pretty, the, the, the bylaw, whether Ray says we make a lot of changes, it moves pretty slowly on these things um, that we wanna make sure we're, here, we're hearing from everybody and we're doing it the right way. So uh, that's, I, I don't think it was an easy out. Um, I think it's the prudent thing to do. Um, I think we gave it a, a high degree of attention and deliberation and that's where we came down. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Evan, you've got a question or comment? Yeah, I do, Bob. I just have one actually for Gordon first. I, I know it's just been two years since we passed the ADU uh, bylaw. How many ADU permits have we granted during that time period? I think it's 13 is the number that uh, that we had most recently on uh, for permits uh, in the primary dwelling. And I apologize. I didn't I did not tune into these these hearings, but I know that when we talked about originally, this was kind of the first step in getting comfortable with ADUs and potentially taking the next step to what Ray has has petitioned for. Um, had he not brought this petition forward, how was the board looking at at getting to that kind of natural next step? Um, and in what frame uh, time frame were we potentially looking at expanding the bylaw, if at all? Well, so it's it's 13 in just about three years because it probably came effective sometime after town meeting 2018. Sure um, and one of those years is a pandemic, whether we want to uh, uh, chalk anything up to that or not. Um, that is not an overwhelming response, I would say, 13. Um, you know, I think that uh, people were probably still learning about it and learning about the opportunity and seeing if it made sense for them. Um, we would probably given it had given it another couple of years and then seen somebody else may have brought another petition together or, or there may have been a suggestion that we investigate it, but we probably wouldn't have done it this year. Okay. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, any other members of advisory uh, that have questions or comments? Uh, members of other town boards? I see Diane DiNapoli has her, her hand up. Diane, could you identify yourself by name and address? Yes, thank you very much, Diane DiNapoli, 16 Gardner Street. My question was actually for Gordon, if that's okay. Um, do you know of the 13, was how many, do you have that broken down into categories, say how many people may have disabilities versus seniors? And do you know how many people have applied and then may not have met the criteria that exists today? I, I, I don't know the details that you're asking about. I don't know whether the, the um, building department has those. We can, we can look at it. Um, and I don't believe there have been many, if any, uh, denied, right? Uh, so, um, but I, will, I can confirm that for you, Diane, and get back to you, because I don't know the answer to that for sure. Thank you. Other questions or comments from members of the general public? I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, Andy, do you want to probably summarize your recommendation or just adopt it from what you've circulated? Uh, yes, my recommendation is as uh, set forth in the, uh, um, the document containing the article uh, comment, uh, and recommended it is to establish the study committee uh, precisely as the planning board has laid it out uh, for the reasons that the planning board has laid out and with the uh, within the time frame that the planning board has laid out. Uh, uh, this makes uh, eminent sense to me and uh, uh, this is what I think that the town should do. Um, I I've noticed in looking at some past uh, warrant articles that this is uh, uh, this is not an uncommon, I should say, uh, outcome uh, for a uh, uh, a proposed amendment to a bylaw, and uh, it does appear to me to be the in the correct form, namely uh, making a recommendation that uh, uh, essentially defers, if you will. Uh, or takes no action on the main main motion, uh, but I'll I'll leave it to better parliamentarians than I to tell me if 
if this should uh, be worded any other way, but in any event, the substance of what I would like a vote on tonight is uh, uh, no action on the main motion, but the adoption of the recommended uh, uh, <clears throat> recommendation of a, a study committee. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we'll come to vote. Um, Alan. Oh, Alan's not in his chair. Nancy. Aye. Julie. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Victor. Aye. Dave. Aye. Alan's back. Aye. Yes. Thanks. Aye. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Andy. Aye. George. Aye. Davaline. Aye. Aaron. Aye. Libby. Aye. And Evan. Aye. I think that's 14 0. I, I also will note for the benefit of anybody that's watching that the, uh, the warrant article that was set forth uh, on the town website uh, did not have sections four and five of uh, the accessory dwelling units um, uh, uh, bylaw. So, those have been included in Andy's comment. Thanks for that pickup today. And they, they, and they were included in, in Mr. Estes. Yes. Uh, original citizen petition. Right, as submitted to the town. So thank you, Andy. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Susan Murphy. And um, I think that will bring us to our next uh, agenda item, which is the education budget recommendation from ACES. So I'll turn the floor over to Dave Anderson. Okay, um, thanks, Bob. Um, let me just, you know, a lot of folks have seen a lot of information about the school committee through their presentation. So let me just give you a statement. This is a statement on behalf of all of ACES, uh, all five of us. ACES recommends the full proposed education budget request of $61 million, $792, $1,079. That is the gross amount before deducting anticipated elementary and secondary school emergency recovery funding, what you guys have heard referred to as the ESSER funding. Uh, that's the two and the ESSER three. The education all and social and emotional impact on students from COVID is indisputable and the need to address it is urgent. We believe Hingham's education leaders have presented a budget to begin to address both the COVID impacts and historical underachievement by certain students who will benefit from the additional supports. While the total number of proposed new FTEs may appear high, when looked at in context, it is instead essential. There is incremental support in math and reading for elementary and middle school students. There is additional administrative and instructional support for students with IEPs, that's uh, individual uh, education plans, uh, a population that is expected to grow due to academic setbacks and learning loss due to COVID. Finally, there are modest incremental additions, some fractional to the high school to reduce certain class sizes to improve, to improve achievement. In recommending the proposed budget, we recognize that absent the use of certain COVID related external funding sources and use of the town's own rainy day fund, Hingham currently lacks the annual recurring revenue to support these additions. Despite this, we believe use of so-called one-time funds this year is critical to addressing the problems. It is our view that, a rush, that rushing an operational override to fund the FY22 budget without the necessary planning to consider all of Hingham's needs would be a mistake. On the other hand, waiting to address the immediate learning loss by making only incremental investments this year will only make the problem worse and likely more expensive to remediate in future years. ACES believes this budget should be funded now, and it should be funded without an FY22 operating override. Looking ahead, however, Hingham will have a problem to solve. How do we support the entire town budget in FY23 and beyond? To address this, ACES supports the study of new revenue sources, including an operating override. This analysis should consider all parts of Hingham's budget, including, for, including the forthcoming school department, master plan and Hingham's new master plan, 
among other items. It must also consider the anticipated capital investments the town hopes to make in the next few years, including Foster School and the public safety facility. Importantly, the future growth rate of certain expenses must be reduced. Proposition two and a half is incompatible with expense growth rates materially in excess of two and a half percent absent new revenue from some source. This is a mathematical reality that can no longer be ignored. Our town's needs are urgent and they deserve to be funded now. Over the next year, Hingham residents will come together in good faith to solve the funding issue for future years. I and the rest of my ACES colleagues encourage you to support this budget. Uh, Dave, I'd like to, on behalf of the entire advisory committee, thank you and thank the other ACEs, uh, George and Erin and Evan and Andy, for all the work you've done on this and for that thoughtful recommendation. And I will open the floor to questions or comments from other members of the advisory committee at this point. Alan. Yeah. I'll just uh, comment. I guess I've probably been the, the grumpiest of the group on, on what the, uh, the number is, at least vocally. Um, and I, I guess I would just say, I, in, in the end, you know, I, um, I, I remain a little concerned about taking that big of a jump, but, but again, recognize the, the circumstances. Uh, I remain concerned about what happens through sort of taking this step and hoping that we can get the override next year. But in the absence of an alternative that I, I don't have uh, and any proposed reduction would admittedly be arbitrary. Uh, and I, I respect the process Dave and the ACES committee went through. And uh, uh, so I, I accept the recommendation and, and thank you. Thanks for the group to really diving into the numbers and reviewing and analyzing it. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Anyone else from advisory with a question or a comment? I have a question, Dave, because it kind of came up in discussions with uh, Julie today about um, when we come to budget, the education budget, uh, there's essentially a deduction of the two ESSER funds. Uh, are those, are we sufficiently confident of the receipt of those funds in um, FY22 that we can make that deduction? Well, that's a good question, Bob. And actually, I think what, what, what we approved at least uh, with a good caveat from George during our meeting was we approved the gross amount before the ESSER deductions, because I thought we also had the same concern, particularly as it relates to the ESSER three funding, which as I understand it is still an estimate. I think we have a firm number on the ESSER two of the $430,060. So we didn't wanna, at first, at first I was concerned about ESSER three, so I thought we could approve the net of ESSER two. And then even John said, well, if we're gonna do that, we wouldn't wanna get caught by surprise as you point out. So it may be a question for Sue and it may be a question as to what the selectmen approved. And maybe it's something we can wrestle with ultimately on Thursday night um, because I think your point is well taken. I, I guess I would say that from ACE's perspective, at least as I sit here tonight, I think what, what, what we intended to recommend was the gross number to be sure that the school could pursue the recovery plan as proposed but the school, there was certainly a meeting of the minds during the last ACES call that it's everyone's intent that every ESSER dollar received that's available in FY22 will be used to offset that gross amount. So we know the, we know the objective. I think there was just some reticence about some numbers that weren't firm. Well, I know um, Julie and I had scheduled a call with uh, Sue and Tom and Michelle uh, Monsiger tomorrow with, to be joined by John Coughlin to kind of address the format of the uh, recommended uh, motion uh, for Article 6. 
Uh, Sue, did you want to weigh in on this tonight? Yeah, I, I do remember our last forecast meeting. Um, what basically was said is we are going to use one-time money. And if either the American, um, the federal grant for the town, the whole town, and the ESSA grants for, for the schools, if none of those materialize, we are essentially saying we are funding it. And if they don't materialize, um, we will be using um, the balance in fund balance to offset. So um, looking forward to Thursday night, <clears throat> we, we then have to approve budgets uh, as if uh, we were not getting ESSER funds or America Recovery Act funds. Well, you're, you're approving the budgets. Um, I mean, the, the forecast is a balanced budget and we have the American, um, the, the federal money in there. We have the ESSER money in there. If those aren't, if, <laughs> sorry, if those don't come in, <laughs> we will be, we'll be substituting the grants for fund balance. Okay. And you so don't one think way we, or another, it's going to be funded. All right. You don't think we need to put specific language about America Recovery Act or ESSER funding into any kind of recommended motion? Uh, no, because I think the ESSER grants, remember when we got the ARA grants for the schools? I can't remember what fiscal year, but in Article 6, the recommended motion for the school budget was fully funded and in parentheses, it said a certain number of money for the ARA grants was being used to offset. We can do the exact same thing with the ESSA grants. Okay. Bob, I'll just um, say, I, you know, I think you raise a good question and um, it's something that we, I know we talked about in the last forecast meeting too. And, and I have some, I just have some general um, it's not a concern, but just questions about the, the presentation of a net budget versus a gross budget, because I think we want to be clear with people about what the expenses are we're incurring and recognizing to Alan's point that there is an offset embedded in there. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, because I think about previous budgets I've voted on, you know, in previous years, Thursday nights, if, if you will, where we haven't had we haven't had this, the specter of a significant uh, fund balance draw if something wasn't to materialize. Maybe I wasn't around, I don't think, for the ARA money, which Sue's talking about, which makes me feel better because maybe there is, as long as there's precedent for that, because I don't think any of us expect it's not going to materialize, but I understand your question is a good one, which is that I would hate for someone to challenge the use of fund balance to cover this uh, you know, or, or John feeling as though he's coming for a reserve fund transfer, when in reality we funded him, uh, and we had to find it. We had to use a different pocket because the the federal money fell through. So, um, well, I think it's an important question. I, I'm glad you my, raised it. My thinking right now is that we basically have to um, vote to fund everything, and that. To the extent that those federal monies arrive and can be used, that they will then be used as an offset within the year to the various budgets. So that then amounts of fund balance that might otherwise have been spent will not be spent. And at the end of the year, will flow back into fund balance. Is that how you see it, Sue? Yes, and Dave, to your point, we did change the uh, forecast around to have Article Six, the the gross for for educational budget, and we put the ESSA grants on a separate line item. Oh, fair. And just just like on the forecast and the the resources, we separated out fund balance with the American Recovery Act. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Julie, you have a question or comment? Well, to Sue, your point about the ARA grants, can you, I don't know, you, you know, don't know which year, but is it like 10 years ago that they came in or do you have a 
Okay. I've, been, I've been town accountant since 2010, so it's in between 2010 okay. and now. All right, so I'll start hunting through Article 6s. Um, I, can, I can find them in the morning and just and scan it right to you. Okay, thank you. And You're then welcome. I do have a second question about the funding that's coming in from ESSER or the America, American Relief Act. Do you know if it's coming in? Do you know if it would come in and just come in as into fund balance or is it coming in, both of them are coming in as state aid or how, how would they come in? So then, then therefore, if we're writing the recommended motion for article six, then we say where we can get that funding. Uh, right now, I don't know because we don't know the particulars on how the grants or the federal money is coming in. Um, if we have to separate it out and put expenses toward it, then it would probably go into a grant and then we'll take expenses out of those budgets um, and put it towards the grant. Um, it all depends on the details of what, what the American Recovery Act is and the ESSA grants are. We're, we're segueing a little into our next agenda item, which gets into the mechanics of the actual budget discussion on <clears throat> Thursday night. But before I went on from the ACES recommendation, I wanted to give any member of the, uh, the public or another town board an opportunity to <coughs> ask any questions or comments, uh, offer any comments they might have. I'm, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, so um, I think we, uh, we really have segued into a discussion of kind of our, our budget review and uh, votes and procedures. I, I had another picky question for you, Sue. Um, of course, the last forecast showed uh, uh, the, the 7,000 Seven thousand surplus, um, and I, I know you want the trip to Hawaii, and Julie wants the Adcom party. But do we have to budget that down to zero? No, we don't. We we do not. No, okay. no. There have been there have been town meetings that we've had uh, surplus. Balanced budget just means it can't be a negative. Okay. You can have a little bit of a surplus. And it, right. it has it has changed a little. But we we can't budget for a whopping big surplus to no, no. Okay, all right, all right. Andy, you've got a question. Uh, yes, um, have, have we. I don't think we have voted on the town administrators' uh, recommended additions. Is that um, expected to come up or? Um, we, we, we heard it and we heard uh, from the town administrator and the assistant town administrator on the recommendations. So uh, I assume that will that'll be uh, discussed Thursday to the extent there needs to be any further discussion. Well, I wanted to go through that because I'd certainly appreciate the guidance of um, everyone on the, the committee. What we have done in years past is we have actually gone budget by budget in terms of the recommended salaries and expenses and in some instances, uh, additional items. And we have, if anyone has a hold on any of those budgets, they, they place the hold. And then we have voted all of those budgets and then we have circled back to the additional requests. And um, uh, Dave and Sue, um, do you kind of had the same tool we've used in the past years? Uh, I, sent, I, I sent it to Dave the other day. Yep. So it's basically the budgets are presented in the order that they're in our um, uh, budget in books. Power. Yep. Well, it, no, there it's as it, as presented in Article Six. Yes. Okay. Our budget books went alphabetical, I guess. Uh, but All right. Article All right. So 6 that, is Article 6. 
So we, we one, of the, one of the reasons I asked is, is you know, earlier uh, we talked um, about the senior planner position and it seems to be necessary to go back and take a look at the, uh, the budget. And that's why I wondered whether uh, given that the town administrator is recommending that the board of selectmen budget uh, add in uh, some people and as well as there be different positions added in different other departments. Do we have to, do we talk about those at the time? Uh, so for I, example, we talked about hoping, this. I was hoping to discuss that before. I was, I was going through what I thought the budget process was going to be, and we were going to get to that. Oh, all right. Enough. All right. Thank you. So, yep. so in the past, we have voted all the basic budgets at once, and then we've come back to additional requests. And uh, those are loaded into the same tool that we've used. Yep. Sue and Dave. Uh, so, yeah, they will be. Okay, so we will see as additional requests, each of the um, additional requests that the town administrator has made and that are on his slides for separate consideration. And, and then we can vote on those. When we get to the, uh, to the education budget, are we just seeing the one overall number for the recovery budget? Uh, Sue can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the actual budget line items have uh, salaries and expenses like other budgets do. Um, I don't have a break. I don't have that number we recommended broken down by that. We could, um, I don't know. I think in years past, Sue, we've, we've just voted the ACEs recommended number, which was the sum, right? Uh, you, do, you do payroll and expenses, yes. Um, usually when ACEs recommends a budget amount, um, usually the additional is separate, but when we come to vote, then it's just that one, one lump sum. For example, last year, Dave, I think the ACEs recommendation yeah, right. was separated, separated from additional requests. And after we addressed all the additional requests and we had a hundred or a hundred and ten thousand uh, dollars yet to spend, we decided to apply that to the school's yep. additional requests. Yep. I know you're right. I'm remembering that now. Well, maybe we can. Uh... So, so my question is kind of, you know how this, uh, Dr. Rustin broke down his budget um, <clears throat> into different levels at one point anyway. And it, it, it seems to me that it probably makes most sense to vote the number that ACES has recommended. Uh... It does. I agree. I mean, the, the one other choice that's that's easy without a lot of brain damage would be to vote. Um, you know, I'm thinking back. I don't have it in front of me, but the the May eighth presentation from the school committee I think showed a level services number, and then they showed the the total recovery budget. I mean, we that's one step. If if we felt the need to kind of break it down in one component, that would be a, a way to go about it. Um, well. But I also don't want to create, I, I, you know, I mean, I don't want to do it just to do it. If it's, if it's valuable, we can do it. We can do it any way you want. It's just, it gets a little, um, you know, I just want to know how much math we got to be doing between now and Thursday night. That's all. Well, it seems to me that it probably makes most sense to vote the total number recommended by ACES. And if, if somebody wants to debate that number, they just hold that budget. Okay. It, and we set it aside until um, we vote on the all the other budgets that have not been held. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. Uh, my memory is that last year that 
we voted a single number and that we looked at each of the three uh, budget levels and their numbers just to get an understanding of wh what would be the consequences of the votes that we were ab the, about to take. And, and then we came to a, a, a vote on a single number. Last year's warrant does have a payroll and expenses and a capital number for school. Yep. Yeah, it, does. it definitely does. And Sue and I have, and have been talking about that number too, because it's a it, what we calculate in for that book versus what John might calculate might be a little bit different, but we'll, we'll get to that point for sure. Okay. I, I also had a question for you, Sue, uh, that came up in discussion today about uh, in last year's warrant, for example, I'm looking at police department. Um, and there are parenthetical entries beside capital outlay, for example, 58.5 from municipal waterways and 396 from available reserves. And, and there are other notations with respect to other budgets as to when those are, all, those are all the sources, yep. Um, and they seem to be mostly capital outlay. But is, is that <laughs> that's something? The, that's the fund balance number that we uh, we use to balance the budget. Okay. And we <laughs> usually put it to all capital and one-time expenses like debt or, you know, OPEB or retirement. Well, the advisory committee doesn't typically see that overall format used in Article 6. Yeah, because we do it after all the votes, the budgets are voted in to put it in to um, the warrant book. That was just, we did that, Bob, to show that we were um, using other, with other our financial sources. Policy. Okay. Bob? But, yeah, Libby. I was just going to say, as far as capital goes, um, I recall last year when we went through the format um, that, you know, Sue and Dave are talking about where it was with department amounts and Dave and I would kind of look at each other and go, okay, yep, is that what's on the five-year plan that Eric Valentine and the Capital Outlay Committee proposed? So I think we do, um, unless my memory's wrong, I thought we do actually, whether it's a a formal vote actually it is because we haven't voted the capital budget yet so we do it department by department at that same time so those you know amounts you're seeing with each department whether it's payrolls expenses and capital it's each department is including the capital getting voted on each component that night well this year we are we are contemplating using more fund balance i.e available reserves uh, than ever before um, is that going to be accounted for in some way in the Article 6 presentation? In the warrant book, yeah. That's something you do after we vote the budget? It is me, yes. <laughs> I get to pick and choose. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Tina, you've had your hand up. Uh, go ahead. I'm not sure if I'm asking the same question that you're asking, and I apologize because I'm new to this, but I wanted to understand if we, because we're presenting a balanced budget, are we not obligated to, um, uh, are we obligated to show that we are voting a budget that's outside of our operational resources, that's outside of our tax levy? Is well, if if you well, look, there's at many other sources besides the tax levy, right. and with the advisory report that uh, Bob is going to write up right after, right after we do the budget, um, the forecast is in there, and it will tell everybody all the different sources that we are using to balance the budget. Yeah, there's gonna be an, write the advisory report party at my house this weekend. <laughs> uh, Ooh. Um, 
Well, one of the things we've looked at is the form of the recommended motion. Uh, for example, uh, Article 6 in the article typically says appropriate or transfer from available reserves. And the recommended motion uh, quite often has not incorporated transfer from available reserves. And it, it does seem like this year, those words probably ought to be in there, but that's one of the things we're gonna talk about with you and John Coughlin tomorrow soon. So um, there's, there's a heads up on that one. Um, I think I've tried to outline what I foresee as the uh, the process will follow Thursday night. I, I think each person uh, should know the, uh, the budgets that they're responsible for, should review them, um, should be prepared to uh, reiterate their recommendations on salaries, expenses, and capital. Uh, and we will march through the town's finances um, and take our vote on how we see things. Uh, any other questions or observations or helpful comments tonight? Julie. Well, I, I'm trying to be helpful, but you know, we have the um, recommended or the additional requests rather in our budget books, but really we just have this list but that's what the recommended motion, um, excuse me, recommended additions are from the town administrator. So instead of, I just wanted to remind people that don't go through the books because it's really what the town administrator gave us a week or so ago. Right, and as I understand it, uh, Dave and Sue are gonna be incorporating that into the, the tool we'll be using. Okay, good. Bob, can I just ask you one quick question? Um, of course. Because we've never really had this situation and it's a little bit kind of on Tina's question. We will be voting expenses, but are we comfortable, or maybe you can ask this of John tomorrow, are we comfortable uh, stipulating, for lack of a better word, that the ESSER, one, ESSER 2, ESSER 3, uh, funding is in there as a source for the purposes of getting to our proposed balanced budget tonight. In other words, are we, we're not going to start from a budget that's missing those revenue sources and then vote to add them in, are we? I think that kind of comes back to what I raised initially. You know, I, I think we have to vote um, the full amount of each budget that we uh, see is appropriate. And well, that to, 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 to the extent the ESSER or um, American Recovery Act funds come in, um, those are just going to be offsets to expenses throughout the year. No, no, I agree with you right there. I wasn't clear then. I'm just thinking I'm, this is more literally nuts and bolts in terms of the model. We need to finish our vote Thursday night with a with a number that's zero or or black, not red, in the surplus and deficit for 2022. Right. Um, and I agree with you. So, for example, if we vote the the full ACES amount uh, and that's approved by Adcom for education, that's fine on the expense side of the ledger. But implicit in that, on the revenue side of the ledger, so that we don't end up, you know, I mean, well. Let me ask the question a different way. The, the finished budget that we vote tomorrow night will be balanced, but I assume it will be balanced with, well, I don't want to assume that. Will it be balanced with assumed line items for American Recovery Act, ESSER 2, ESSER 3 as an example in that balancing, or is it going to be balanced on the back of fund balance explicitly with a footnote that says we anticipate a, a you know this much recovery from other sources such as ARP. Well, I I think as as far as the presentation of Article Six goes, 
we're not ordinarily showing revenues in Article Six. We're showing expenditures. Right. And but and the, in our in discussion, my spreadsheet shows revenue, so we should get to a zero tomorrow night. Right, but um, what we are voting on are individual department budgets, exp uh, salaries, expenses, capital outlay. Uh, the forecast indicates to us that we will be using ESSER funds and American Recovery Act funds. Bob? And, oh, oh, sorry, I thought you were done. And, and that those funds will therefore be uh, used as revenue sources throughout the year. But as when we talked about this before, if for whatever reason those funds don't materialize and we can't use them, they are backstopped by fund balance. Or they'll have to be backstopped by expense cuts throughout the year, similar to the financial management plan. Right. No, no, under, understood. I'm literally just thinking about the model. Maybe we, you and I can take it offline and with Sue too, because it's more, maybe it's more of a just a... Okay. Blocking and tackling question than a strategic one. Sorry. No, that's that's a that's and, a good idea. And Bob, uh, I just wanted to say to pull the pieces what I'm hearing, and I think to summarize it is that what I'm hearing from what Sue said and Dave said is, and what we know we've always voted for the X amount of years is Article Six would be all the gross expenses. What I'm hearing Sue say is that in the past when we've had grants, we note that at the bottom of Article Six. So in this case, we have a potential of a federal grant and two state grants on the, for education, ESSER 1, or sorry, ESSER 2, ESSER 3. And then as part of us implicitly voting that budget, we're also then voting on the source side, a fund balance. But my, my point would be, or my, my request would be, is since it's such a unique year where we are using one-time money, and in this case, we're saying, hey, our plan is to balance it with this one-time federal and state grant money, but if that doesn't come in, our backstops fund balance. To, from my perspective, I feel that that needs to be an explicit vote on Thursday night. And I think if my memory serves from previous times, I'm not sure if we got that granular, but I think because of the uniqueness with this year, I think that's an extra belt and suspenders vote that would be good. And then I'll, you know, obviously, then we leave it to you and, and Sue and um, the town administrator to decide how it's going to be in, you know, displayed in the warrant. But I think that's beyond what we can all determine. Well, for those of us who remember the famous jump off the two inch cliff to, to use fund balance that year, um, that was an explicit vote of advisory. Um, you know, we, we decided that even though we didn't think it was quite in uh, quite consistent with the financial policy, that uh, we were going to balance the budget that year. I think it was about two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, so I think that needs to be part of the vote. Kevin. Okay, I'm going to stop using raise my hand if you don't call on me. Um, I'm just going to jump in like everybody else does. Is so I'm going to patient. Can I ask? Can I ask the actual accountant a question here? Of course. So Sue, we seem to be going around and around on this. And if I'm oversimplifying, you don't seem necessarily rattled about the funding sources because to Tina's question and Dave's point, we vote the total expenditures and you are just going to insert line items for funding sources that include the federal money around ARA and then the various education things. Yes. Okay. So we seem to be talking around it and we, we this could happen any year. Yes. Outside of a pandemic, we may not get the state grants we expect. So, and I, I think we also make are making it sound a little bit like money we fairly certain is coming in unless giant meteor strikes will come in. And we just don't know the ESSER three dollar exact amount yet. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I was paying attention. <laughs> A plus. <laughs> um, 
So I take it there have been no further adjustments to the forecast. Uh, well, uh, the only thing we did is we, in the forecast, uh, capital outlay was at the forecasted amount, but we had to adjust it to the actual. Um, so the, it, it, it's very insequential, it's very little. Okay, all right. Any other questions or comments on the budget process or the- There you go, Victor and Alan. And Julie. Oh, I'm sorry. All of a sudden, new uh, hands are going up. <laughs> new hands. Ellen. So just on that discussion, I'm wondering if there's any help in looking at the state process, which is um, that there is actually a formal vote to adopt a consensus revenue figure. Um, it, it maybe is part of our procedure or something. There's an acknowledgement or a vote of some sort of here is our, here's our consensus revenue figure upon which we are building the budget. And, and then subsequently, sometimes, you know, budgets can be built on utilizing rainy day funds or, you know, that there may be a model there if, if you're trying to figure out how to acknowledge revenue sources. I, I'm not familiar with the state procedure, um, but it seems to me we're, we're basically going to rely on the, the forecast uh, for the revenues that we expect to have. In essence, the state the state process is is like taking the forecast and sort of officially saying, "Okay, this is we all agree this is the revenue number upon which we're going to build the build the expense." Then, sort of as two separate votes. Okay, uh, Victor. So, just to clarify, going back to the when when you say backstop by fund balance, I mean if we're assuming the federal grants, and for some reason they didn't come in to use fund balance at that point i'm assuming we'd need a reserve fund transfer or a new vote right we need a vote to transfer from from fund balance it it depends on how the article six recommended motion is written i mean if if um the recommended motion talks about transferring from available funds. I think that vote covers it, which is why I think, and, and we'll get John Coughlin's perspective on this tomorrow, why I think that language especially ought to be in there this year um, and, and have an explicit discussion in the advisory committee report. Did I, was there another hand that was raised that I didn't get to? Okay. Uh, any members of the general public that have a question or comment? Oh, Andy. Uh, I just, uh, for clarification, on the Plymouth River School windows, we are going to uh, vote or recommend a vote on a number that's going to be what in the two and a half million dollar range or so. Dave, we think. I, I think it may be higher than that, but I, I don't. Okay. And um, uh, but as we say in the commentary, we anticipate a percentage of that. Um, what? 37.5% uh, will be paid by the uh, MSBA and the uh, million dollar mitigation payment by Broadco developers. Um, but if, if the state did not, it, well, first of all, my first question is, is that whatever that figure is gonna be, say three million, three and a half million, is that in your forecast? No, because it's a borrowing. That's excluded. okay. All right. Well, that moves everything. All right. Yeah, Thank it's, you. It's not within the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions, comments from members of the public? Not seeing any hands. 
So um, we can move on to review and approval of minutes from March 9th. Um, George has circulated the minutes. And George, did you get my edits? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Evan. <laughs> there, there, shall be, there shall be no gaslighting on the advisory committee. <laughs> um, I'm sure I did, Evan, and, and I'm sure I put them right in. <laughs> just like yeah, right, into the, right into the trash, right, George? <laughs> oh, no, that's just mean, Julie. It, any, uh, any questions for additional... Uh, uh, our comments about additional edits? If not, I'll accept the motion to approve. So moved. Okay. There is a second. Okay. Second. Um, uh, Alan. All right. Nancy. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Victor. Aye. Dave. Aye. Andy. Andy? Thank God he is, though. First to Andy. Aye. Thank you. George? Aye. Davaline? Aye. Evan? Aye, but only if George gets all of my edits in. <laughs> Tina? Aye. Julie? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Libby. Aye. You know, Evan, uh, advisory committee style doesn't allow us to capitalize every letter in your name. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the smiley face in the A. There you go. And I think we're deferring the, the 18th minutes till Thursday, George? That's correct. That's right. Okay. All right. Any liaison reports? Anybody doing any liaising? I, I think we've all been busy enough. Bob, and actually, I, oh, you know, I ahead. think there's the potential that capital might get more money. So there is a capital outlay meeting tomorrow night um, to take the list of when it was 500,000. We, we voted on a list. But if that's pared down to say, I think the selectmen's recommendation is maybe 300, is we're going to be voting that tomorrow night. So by the time we are voting on Thursday night, we will have um, the specific amounts to be able to identify which department they go into. So Dave, when they're getting put into each department in the model, um, we'll know what that final amount is. Because it will, the expectation is that if we are to vote some increase to capital, that that will need to be kind of rolled into Article 6. So that's it. The selectmen, of course, are voting the budget tonight. Um, I would think that their meeting would be posted to Harbor Media by uh, mid to late afternoon tomorrow. Uh, probably worthwhile watching the discussion. Uh, I do want to say as well that the selectmen are hosting a meeting for the same time as our meeting on Thursday. So they will uh, uh, probably be in attendance um, uh, whether they'll be participating in any discussion or not, um, it's too too early to tell. But, Same with uh, the school committee. School committee I mean, did too. The school committee did too. The school committee is posting for the same time as well? They already did, yeah. All right. And um, so we will have all the uh, important people present. Um, Next week, I don't know that we need to meet. Um, really? Say swear to God. <laughs> um, we've been going at it hard um, between the editors and myself and the people that still have articles to submit. Um, 
We'll be getting everything into town administrator's office so that the warrant can be complete. Um, uh, Carrie Nee and Mary Power and I will be writing our respective committee's reports. And uh, uh, next week may be a week of rest. Uh, we will need to schedule a meeting, uh, at least one meeting, probably the week before town meeting, uh, whenever you think the reserve fund number is gonna be ready soon. And we still have the policies and procedures to discuss at a meeting after still, the warrant. We still have the policies and procedures to discuss. And we typically have a meeting the um, before the town meeting to discuss any wrap up. Um, but um, there's been a lot of great work done, uh, most appreciated. And I don't know that I have anything else for tonight. Bob, are you saying that you you don't think that there's a chance that we'll meet on April 6th? I just wanted to confirm something. I'm not trying to meet on April 6th, but. I think we um, should meet on April 6th. Um, it's going to be you in that meeting, Andy. Just sitting in a little porta potty you know, all by myself. I, it, it's, it's hard to predict what's going to come up. What is, is April 6th a week from next Tuesday? Yeah, it's two weeks from today. Okay. I like that a week from next Tuesday is a much more <laughs> confusing way of saying two weeks from today. Uh, you know, Evan, all I think about is Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays and Tuesdays for posting. Um, I'm gonna start drinking again. So um, any matters not anticipated within 48 hours? So Bob, I just have a question or a, a, a request. So for those who had articles that were approved tonight, if you don't have any changes to make, would you just let your editor, either Nancy or me, know that? And if you have changes, then get, you know, whenever you get things to us is fine. But if you're not going to make any changes, if you just tell us we have the copy of the, the most recent copy of the comment. Or just for clarity, just resend us whatever is your final doc. Yeah, so that we can get that work done. Thank you. Matters not anticipated within 48 hours? Hearing none, I'd accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Yep. Alan. This first thing is tough. Uh, aye. Nancy. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Victor. Aye. Dave. Aye. Andy. Aye. George. Aye. Dave Elaine. Aye. Evan. Aye. Tina. Aye. Julie. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Aaron. Aye. Libby. Aye.